It's not easy for us busy geotechnical engineers to keep up with industry trends while keeping up with our engineering work. Therefore, it's our goal of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast to help you do just that. We strive to keep our listeners informed on important industry topics and also to educate you on interesting technical topics and trends in the geotechnical world. And in today's episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, I'll be talking with Tom W. Porter, PE, Principal Engineer at Romig Engineers Incorporated. We'll also be talking to Christina Tip, PG, CEG, who's a professional geologist with SHN. And you'll remember that Christina was recently seen on episode 42 of the podcast, where she talked about the overlap between geological and geotechnical engineering. And in this episode, we'll be talking about variable site conditions in the Bay Area. We'll also be talking a bit about what it's like to work at a small or medium-sized engineering firm. And we'll also discuss some of the best methods of training entry-level staff. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you yet another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. And with that, let's jump right into today's episode. Before we go on here, I'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, Tensar International. Here's a message from Tensar about their award-winning software, Tensar Plus, which is available to you at no cost. Check out Tensar Plus, the award-winning design software for construction professionals to design with geosynthetics and calculate their value on projects. Tensar Plus is simple to use with a powerful engineering system at its core. It leverages our decades of research and experience with soils all over the world, so you can count on your solutions working the first time, even in the most difficult conditions. Whether you're designing a crane pad or need to build a temporary road over muck, the cost, time, and carbon savings can be calculated, making comparison with alternatives simple. Specs, reports, and product data can be generated for your design, and Training resources, research, and our third-party expert reviews are all provided conveniently in the software if needed. Usable both online and offline, the app is available in browser and on all major mobile platforms. Whatever you're working on, Tensar Plus is your toolbox for success. Hello, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Christina, Tom, how are you doing? Doing great. So happy to be here. Thanks for having uh, me. Hello, Christina. Hello, Jared. Hi. Happy to be here too. Again. Nice to see yeah, you, Jared. <laughs> I feel like I feel like deja vu. I feel like we've done this before, but it does feel <laughs> a little different. This is gonna be cool. It's gonna be cool. Well, glad, glad to have both of you on the show. And um, it would be great if you, you both could tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and what it is that you do on a daily basis. Uh, Christina, we'll start with you, ladies first, and we'll get right into Tom. All right. Yeah, I'm a certified engineering geologist in California. I get to go do site visits, field explorations, drilling, test pits, write reports, do the research, work with geotechnical engineers on a daily basis. Um, All the good stuff, all the geologic hazards in California, I get to deal with. Nice, nice. Todd, what about you? Yeah, I am a uh, an engineer working for a geotechnical co- consultation firm and um, registered professional engineer in California, and um, work on a daily basis. Very similar to what Christina just said, we do site investigations. Um, you know, as a, as a principal of the company, I'm doing mostly uh, reviews and managing um, the with the help of the ownership group managing the company and. Um, making sure that everything goes smoothly and all of our drilling and our reports and our plan reviews and everything goes smoothly and we get things out on time. Great. On time is great. Smooth is even better, right? (laughs) (laughs) But Tom, it would be great if you could talk to us a little bit more about the uh, engineering in the Bay Area. So in general, you know, what makes it different from engineering in other areas? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a really great question. And that's actually something that when we're, uh, um, interviewing engineers especially from out of the area it's kind of a a selling point for us here is that you know uh, the conditions in the Bay Area are extremely variable and and diverse Um, you know we have a a kind of a niche kind of area here where we are um, kind of sandwiched between San Francisco and San Jose and the Pacific Ocean and and the Bay itself and um, 
you know, within an, a couple hours drive, you could be up in the mountains in the wooded area looking at landslides. And then a couple hours later, you might be down at a site along the bay margin environment and you have deep bay mud and soft soils. Um, you know, we, we have a very diverse range of projects, um, you know, that we work on. Um, anything from, from high-rise commercial buildings to uh, residential improvements, um, swimming pools, um, you know, mansions, um, and, and even public works and, and working on compaction testing for roadways and, and water districts. So, so we kind of do it all. Um, you know, not having had a lot of experience in other areas, it's hard for me to say what, you know, there, there's obviously other areas of the country and the state that, that have diverse conditions as well. But, you know, this area I feel like is one, one of the most variable geo, uh, geologic and, um, you know, hazards and, and other things that are, that are going on. You know, we're not, we're not in the, you know, Arizona where it's just all hard pan or, or Southern California or some other areas of the country where, um, you know, conditions probably are very uniform. Um, it's, it's very non-uniform here. And so you have to be on your toes. That's what we tell young engineers is that you have to be ready to, to, to see two or three completely different things in one day, uh, maybe on, on, on a rare day. But, um, you know, the conditions can change um, from day to day and site to site. Got it, got it, got it. So you are not going to get bored. <laughs> not no. get bored. <laughs> Christina, from a geologic standpoint, I think you could look at the Greater Bay Area and say it's very complex and perhaps mm -hmm. it has most, if not every geologic hazard on the planet could occur in this really small, thin area, right? Uh, what are some of the geological hazards that you've seen in the Bay Area? Yeah, so I, I worked for, I think it was like 12 years in the Bay Area and exactly like how Tom mentioned. And what in the morning I could be drilling through fill placed on bay mud along the bay. And then the afternoon I might be up in the Santa Cruz mountains hitting refusal with the drill rig. So mm -hmm. you, you gotta be ready to be, are we looking at liquefaction today? Are we looking at, we're gonna hit rock? We're gonna do drilled piers up here. So you have this landslides, debris flows, rock falls, down at the bay, liquefaction and settlement. And then even in the foothills, that's where our fault lines generally are. So prepare for shaking always. But we also, the Bay Area has really expansive soil, which I've seen it heave houses and heave driveways. And then there's even a smaller area that has this expansive rock, which is a huge problem area. And it's in a pretty fancy neighborhood in the Bay Area. So that pushes pools, pushes houses like right out of the ground. So a lot of really fun <laughs> dynamic conditions for Tom to engineer. So I worked with Tom for a lot of those and like, what is Tom gonna do about this? And what are we seeing out here? It, it was really fun to um, deal with all those. It's such a variable place. Really cool. And Tom, what about groundwater in the Bay Area? How, how does the groundwater conditions how does it affect your projects yeah you know um that's another thing that's very variable because um you know we're on the bay margin environment and you're going to have shallow groundwater and then as you as you head more you know up to the foothills and the mountains um that's going to deepen but then you're going to get perch groundwater conditions so i think the 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 biggest thing to understand is what the groundwater is and, and potential future groundwater variability across the site because when you're designing you're not only designing for the groundwater then but what it may be in the future so that there's a bit of an art there the biggest issue when it is when it comes to basement design the main thing that people are doing most of the time these days which you guys have probably seen is a lot of basements are going in basement below houses and and definitely commercial buildings because of land use constraints and some other things they're putting in two uh, uh, one, two, sometimes even three levels of basement below these commercial buildings. So understanding the groundwater is, is essential. Um, uh, nobody wants um, you pumping continuously groundwater from, from a basement um, all, all the time. And so you've got to design these things as basements. So a, a design groundwater level is essential um, when you're building these basements as, as basically like a bathtub and completely waterproofing it. Um, and the other flip side is, 
you know, even, even a difference in a foot or two of groundwater may change um, the cost of a project significantly. Um, so you re they really are looking for you to fine tune exactly where groundwater is gonna be, what the, that design level is gonna be, to, to look for hyd hydrostatic forces and make sure that the design is, is gonna be okay for the building long-term. One of the, the big things too is dewatering. You know, it, it, are, it, are you gonna get into water during construction and then the excavation and you're going to have to have a full dewatering system um one one of the new things that they've been doing more and more the last um you know four or five years is doing these secant walls where they actually drill down and put a deep concrete cutoff wall all the way around the excavation then you're locally dewatering only from within the excavation instead of really dewatering a huge radius all around which affects adjacent buildings and roadways and some other things so there's some tricks uh, that are you know being used these days but um you know especially on the bay margin environment groundwater is is probably one of the biggest um, issues to deal with in, in a project and what are you doing to determine the uh, groundwater level during your subsurface exploration? So you're doing observation wells, test pits, both, something else? I mean, uh, most of these jobs will put for, for a job where it's really uh, groundwater is of, of real concern is we'll, we'll put in a, a monitoring well. It will go out there either in one, you know, when we're done with the exploration, if we've done um, some, some deep doorings or CPTs, we'll, we'll take one or two of those and turn it into a piezometer. Um, or go back out to a site and install a piezometer later. If, we, if during our investigation we determine that groundwater could be of an issue with the with the uh, with the basement design, um, so then we can measure it uh, static groundwater level over, over the course of of hopefully at least a few months. In some cases, we've done it over the course of a year um, to really understand where that groundwater is and how it might fluctuate from from the dry to the rainy season. Um, otherwise, you know, in some jobs where that may not be necessarily needed and we have a lot of experience in the area, we have quite a database of groundwater levels that we've encountered near sites. So there might be a residential site on the peninsula where we might have, you know, literally 10 or 15 jobs within a thousand feet foot radius and we have a lot of groundwater data to, to really see how things have worked over the last 10 years. And so we, we can use that as a basis as well. All right, great. Thank you for that. And Christina, when you think about the Bay Area, would you say the Bay Area is more, you know, has a higher risk of liquefaction uh, during an earthquake than other places or just as much? You know, what do you think? The problem with the Bay Area and liquefaction is the uh, fill placed along the Bay margins. Like Tom was mentioning, they're making more areas to develop on. So they're pushing fill farther and farther into the Bay and you can't really put anything on the bay mud and expect it to hold that well. So now they're loading it. So we get a lot of liquefaction around the bay. As you move farther and the groundwater deepens, we see a lot less of it. Now I work two hours north of San Francisco and on the coast. On the coast, there's these marine terraces, which initially I thought, oh, we're going to have some liquefaction up here. But we really don't. The terraces are sandy deposits that are really dense and really old. They've already been shaken a ton. So void space is limited and uplifted. So we don't have the liquefaction on the terraces in north, way north California that I thought we would. There are some valleys, little um, down drop valleys that have, were filled with alluvium. And we do see liquefaction in um, those valleys because groundwater also drains to these valleys and groundwater is pretty high. So wherever the groundwater is high and we have these younger alluvium or bay deposits, that is where we will look for liquefaction. And that we, when we do the analysis, it, it calcs out as like several inches of settlement. Got it, got it. And the several inches of settlement sometimes is that all shallow, or are you seeing that deep, or it really just varies across the site? It varies. It's usually the analysis is done on the top 50 feet. So that's usually where we're looking for. Sometimes it could be really shallow. Other times you'll have this kind of 10 feet of better material. And then beneath that, we'll really see like soft sediment that's capable of um, liquefaction in a large earthquake. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And then um, let's see, Tom, I guess you work at a, you know, somewhat a small firm. What would you say about your experience? I figure that a small firm, 
you get to do a lot of different things, wear a lot of different hats. But what are you, some of the benefits and some of the challenges of um, working at a small firm? You could share with our listeners. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a really good question. And 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 when I first started here um, at Roaming Engineers, I think that um, we were very small. Um, even when Christina kind of came on board, so me and Christina worked for for a good long while, a good ten years plus together, and we were kind of the, the the ones that were doing all the work and doing the drilling and writing the reports. Um, I, I'd say we're probably a little bit more of a medium sized firm now, maybe, but. Um, yeah, I, earlier in my career, I worked for for larger companies, and um, you know, I, I think you can get lost, you know. And, and one thing, you know, with a larger firm too, with multiple offices, is that you know, you don't really know what everybody's doing. Not everybody knows what everybody else is doing, so you really have to have a certain level of um, oversight and bureaucracy with those kind of, kind of companies. With a smaller firm, you know what everybody else is doing. Um, you, you know, you're all working together. It's more of a team environment, which I prefer. For prefer much more um you know there's there's a little bit more oversight but there's nowhere to hide you know everybody knows what everybody's doing and um, you've got to be on your toes and you've, you've got to be be support you know in some ways you're the first and last line of defense so there's sometimes nobody to delegate to nobody to hand off to so so you've, you've got to handle your business um but but for me that that's the way i, I work and i roll and i and i like doing that um but you know um it, it, it does allow for more training. It does allow for, for more oversight and, and to really, um, you know, mentor the younger staff and, and re really be close with everybody, which, which I think is a benefit to everybody, especially, especially younger staff. I would agree. I would agree. I find that younger staff really want to know the bigger picture, not just what is this task I'm working on today, but how does this fit in with the, the whole of what we're doing? So I definitely agree with that. Yeah. And I'd be curious, you know, how, what can you share about how you're able to work yourself up from, you know, uh, a management level position to being a principal in your firm? Some, yeah, some, some, no, some it's, there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if there's any tricks, you know, I, I guess for me, I see myself as one of those people that really worked their way up through the company from, from, from the, from the bottom up. And so, um, you know, I cut my teeth on, on, on some field work and being a staff engineer for a number of years, um, got my graduate degree, got, got my professional engineering um, license, and, and, and you just kind of grind away over the course of, of a number of years and you get a lot of experience. You know, they, they say, and, and I've heard this from, from uh, some of my mentors, is that, you know, the kind of the break, breaking point is about 10 years of, of experience working a, as a project manager or, or an engineer before you know things kind of click you you've seen enough you've worked on enough things you've you've handled enough cases um, uh, hopefully you've had enough success um, to really feel confident enough to to be able to 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 reach that level um, in, in some ways it's being um, ready at the right time and place you know we, we had a need we our company grew um, there was very few of us uh, when I first started and we kind of worked our way up I worked my way up and and as the staff grew we had need for for reviewers and for oversight and for people training um, and handling these things and and it, you just know when you're ready sometimes and, and and the opportunity gets presented and you're there and you grab the reins and, and you take hold so about four years ago um i guess i bought into the company and and became part of the ownership group and became a principal here and um you know it's it's been going great and we've done nothing but grow since so um hopefully uh, that's a success story that continues awesome congratulations that's uh that's a big deal congratulations all right when well, christina let's see when we're talking about mentoring and uh training entry-level staff what are some things that have been successful for you like what what has been successful ways of training staff and then also what are your favorite parts of training new staff <laughs> well work what worked for me and specifically because it was tom training me right out of school was show me what you want and then watch me do it and then let me go let me fly and then check what i do and see if that works so i've continued that with people and uh, entry level students who we start work like working with if they are smart and they get the hang of it that will work for them let them shadow you you shadow them and then let them fly and always like check their work keep communication open sharing what you want to see from that data and what you expect when you give them a report to write 
send it back with the red marks on it, you know, so communications open, you're sharing what you're looking for. You know, it's, it's not a judgment thing. We're a team and we all want to improve. So I think that doing it that way is really good. I love going out with people in the field and getting them trained on the drill rigs and sharing what I'm thinking of, what I'm looking at and my scope of work and how I'm thinking of things out there. And I like to share that with others. Maybe that's not how they think. And I'm open to that. Different people learn differently, but I'll try to share my way. And if they have a different way that works for them, I also am open to arranging to how they want to learn and how they want to do things. So it's good to be a little flexible with everybody. Flexibility is so important. All right, well, we're going to get ready to take a break, but before we do, piece of advice from Christina, piece of advice from Tom for our listeners. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, piece of advice. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, go ahead. time and time again, communication, just communicating with your team, communicating with the people you're training, the client always, but it just, if you communicate with people, they want to work with you. Nothing gets dropped. Like everyone just knows what's going on. Sometimes I have to deliver bad news. Like, hey, that you're choosing a, to build an apartment complex in a fault zone. But I communicated it and I'll share that and I'll help them through it or we, they drop the project, you know, but just being open from the start about what you're finding and where you want to go. Just got to talk it out. Okay, talk it out. And then Tom. Well, I mean, for me, I think the, the best advice I can give to young young engineers is, is be patient. Learn and be patient. Um, don't be in a rush to get to a certain level or a certain place in your career. You know, there's, there's no magic wand or, or a magic button in, in geology or geotechnical engineering. You, you just got to put in the time. You know, I've seen some some younger staff over the years that have, um, you know, why, why aren't I doing this? Why aren't I doing that project? Or how come, you know, I'm, I haven't reached a certain level, you know, expectations are great, but, but sometimes um, they can be a burden and um, you know, you, you got to put it in the time, just, just let your career unfold. Um, let things happen in a natural way. Just learn as much as you can. Uh, and then in an amount of some time, you'll look back and you've re reached your goals and you realize, wow, that, that really happened in the right way. Um, so, so just don't be in a rush. Just in, smell the roses along the way and enjoy it as it happens. That's uh, a great, great note to pause on. So we're going to come back in just a minute and close this one out with Christina and Tom in our Career Factor Safety End segment. Stick around. Before we go on here, I would like to take a minute to recognize our other sponsor for this episode, Menard USA. Menard USA is a specialty ground improvement contractor that works nationally, providing design-build ground improvement solutions at sites with problematic soils. Menard works closely with civil, structural, and geotechnical engineers to minimize foundation costs for wide ranges of soil conditions, structure types, and loading conditions. To learn more about Menard USA or for help on your next project, please visit www.menardusa.com. Dot com. All right, welcome back. It's time for our career factor safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Christina Tick, PG project engineering geologist at SHN. And we're also talking with Tom Porter, PE, principal engineer at Rome Engineers Incorporated. Uh, we've asked this question to Christina some episodes ago. It was on episode 42. So she's going to be off the hook here. But Tom, you're in the hot seat. And we want to know from you, since you've already had a very successful career, when you look back at your career, what's one thing you think that you implemented to give you, let's call it a factor of safety in your career? Yeah, I thought about this, and I think there's a, a lot of interesting ways to probably answer this, but what really came to mind was um, just don't compromise, you know, just just continually do the work the right way. Um, you know, especially when I was younger, it might be out at a job site and working with a contractor who's like, hey, we're buddy buddies, why don't you just, um, you know, these peers are a little bit short or this compaction wasn't done right, but we're fine. We're fine, right? And, and it, sometimes it, it's really hard to stay on your ground. 
or or you're working on a big project and and site conditions are not what you expected or or you know you know that the design team um, is not going to like an answer or you know uh, it's going to cost somebody a lot of money to to give them <laughs> uh, some bad news you know it it does become hard but you always got to do the right thing you always got to stay on your ground you always got to present um things the right way and in the best case and do what's right for the project um and that success and performance of the project um, no matter what and i always tell that to, to young engineers and the people i'm ment <clears throat> mentoring that you know it's important to to do the right thing and and to understand that um, the, the potential bad outcome, um, is not worth the, the risk of, of shortchanging something. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, you came on and shared a lot of great insights with us and I'm sure there's going to be information and advice that's going to help our listeners. And if there's a listener that wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to reach you, Christina? And what's the best way for them to reach you, Tom? Could be an email, could be social media, but where are you? <laughs> Thanks, Jared. Yeah, you can reach me on LinkedIn, search Christina Tip, and you'll find me as a SHN Certified Engineering Geologist. Feel free to reach out to me there. All right, and Tom? Yeah, same. You can reach me on LinkedIn, Tom Porter, PE. Um, search that up or through our website, romagengineers.com. All right, thank you so much for coming on. This is awesome. Thank you, Jared. It was a real fun pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 48, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.